delighted to introduce tonight someone I've known for some years, James Clad, who is now a senior fellow for Asia at the American Foreign Policy Council in Washington, D.C., an organization which I've occasionally had an affiliation with, thanks to its president, Herman Pershner. Herman founded and uh, is president of AFBC, as he has been since the early 1980s, and we're delighted to have his wife, Liz, with us tonight as well. Well, that's enough about Jim. No, actually. <laughs> James is also a senior advisor for Asia at the CNA Corporation in Arlington, Virginia. Um, between 2010, 2002 and 2010, he did several things, including senior counselor at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation and uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South Asia, for South and Southeast Asia, the Defense Department. James trained as a New, New Zealand lawyer, a past he's been able to overcome <laughs> with difficulty. <laughs> with difficulty. Uh, he has also served in the New Zealand Foreign Service. Uh, in places like Delhi, mm -hmm. and indeed extensively in Jakarta, which pertains to the topic he will be addressing tonight. He was also a journalist for many years with one of the truly prestigious publications, the Far Eastern Economic Review. He's the author of a number of books. I'll only mention one, and the latest, since it also pertains to the topic tonight, <clears throat> borderlands of Asia. In 2009, uh, Mr. Clad received the U.S. Secretary of Defense Exceptional Public Service Award. His subject tonight is the Islamic State Attacks Indonesia and its Middle Way. Please join me in welcoming James Clad. Um, I'm really glad to be here because uh, we had, through the auspices of the Asian, uh, the, sorry, the American Foreign Policy Council, the senior vice president, Elon Berman, and I went to Indonesia in April um, for an extremely interesting study tour that was looking at some of the issues I'll try to traverse tonight. Um, we have did an op-ed for the Weekly Standard, and there's actually a report, and if any of you want to see, have a look at it later on, just send me an email. I've got some cards, and if you find it interesting. What I think I might do is go into the things that make Indonesia different, different as and far away from being oh, just another Muslim country, which happens to be the biggest Muslim population in the world. That's generally how it's rated. Stanley Roth, who was Assistant Secretary for Asia under Bill Clinton, used to say tellingly and accurately that Indonesia was the most important country that most Americans knew nothing about. I mean, it is still extraordinary how that remains true today. And so what I'd like to do, if I can, with your permission and forbearance, go through some of the th things that make Indonesia special and have to be thought about when you see a headline that says, you know, another terrorist incident happens in Maidan or something like that without seeing it in context. And of course, that's true of everything everywhere. Your knowledge will be poverty stricken. Okay. Here's the thing about Indonesia. It's a big place, but Java in the middle of it is the biggest all, biggest of all influences. It's 128 million people on a very small island. It's the most densely populated island in the world. Um, it is uh, phenomenally influential, but things are changing. So Sukarno, Suharto, Widodo now, the presidents, most of them in between, except for, I guess, Habibi, we're from Java. So it's Java-centric country still remains by virtue of numbers and temperament, but things are changing. So keep that in mind. You talk about the inner islands, Java and Bali, where Hindu-Buddhist traditions remain strong, affecting their religious devotion. And then you think about the outer, outer islands, which you know have pockets of Christianity and all the rest of it. But it's Java or non-Java, essentially. 
The second thing to think about in Indonesia, and I think this must be unique in the world of Islam, is that the proselytization, did I pronounce that right, of Islam, the spreading of Islam through the archipelago that now forms the Republic of Indonesia, took 850 years to finally the fall of the Hindu Javanese kingdom, Mojapahit, and I think it was 1480. Um, and that is an extraordinarily long period of time to change people's temperament, but it changed the temperament without changing the basis of their past traditions. So that you, it's often described as a place that's very syncretic, meaning layered, layer upon layer. And that happens to be true even of the places that regard themselves as most devoutly Muslim, most assertively Muslim, Aceh. Aceh, for example, which is the tip of Western Sumatra, is the place where up into the middle of the 17th century, actually middle of the beginning of the 18th century, they were fielding ships that would have fair on fights with the Portuguese and the Dutch out there in uh, the Indian Ocean in the Straits of Malacca. I mean, it's a place that's big, pre-existing, pre-colonial traditions. So slow Java, Java-centric or non-Java, slow spread of Islam. Another thing that's more recent to think about is that it was an authoritarian state under Sukarno, under Suharto. That's when I served there as a, as a pipsqueak New Zealand amb amb uh, diplomat running something that became a very interesting project for the Indonesians because they'd never developed it before. And who can tell me what 25% of New Zealand's electricity comes from? Geothermal. Geothermal. Who knows? This must be a very well-informed group. I'm, yes, geothermal. So we had the first geothermal project in Java, and it sees a lot of interest. The Ministry of Mines, the PLN, the electricity people, Pertamina, the oil company. And then one fine day, B.J. Habibi, who became president after Suharto passed, came in and said, that's an interesting project, technically very interesting, I'll have that, and just seized it. It was very interesting, because I got to know the guy. Uh, the thing to do is to realize that that period of time, which is highly authoritarian, yielded with the departure of Suharto and some turbulent times into the next feature I'd like you to remember, which is this is a place that's gone through liberalization and something else, decentralization, right? You can liberalize as much as you want if it's a top-down effort. Often it doesn't go anywhere. People say, yes, we're much freer now, but they're overlooking their shoulder. They're looking over their shoulder. In this case, it's real, and it went down not just to provincial level, it went down to Kabupaten level, which is a unique Indonesian district. And if you think this is fake, you're wrong. And the number of times I've talked to people who would like to get a project underway in Indonesia, you know, invariably natural resources or agricultural, will say, why are there so many hands outstretched to be part of this project, outstretched in the grasping way? Um, and the answer is that a lot more people are part of the decision cycle, which makes uh, illicit payments a little bit more difficult and certainly more time consuming. So it's another feature which is really important to remember. Decentralized and liberalized at the same time. Within that matrix, there's some very interesting changes in political party behavior. It's now a functioning democracy, directly elected president now. It didn't used to be. I remember going along to the sessions of the Supreme Legislature, and Suharto was known for his ponderous, interminable, and uniquely boring speeches. Um, and the Javanese can still remember the cadence. You know, sudara, sudara, dan sabang, sabang, kita, boom, 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 boom. And I feel it was torture for the junior diplomats who were invariably sent, or you'd accompany your ambassador and say, got to run. And, <laughs> and we were there listening to this. But, you know, top down, top down, military presence in the legislature, military presence in the back of everyone's mind. Different now, different. Some of the previous parties exist but they're kind of a shadow of their former selves. There were only three in Suharto's time. They would have elections, when was it, every five years? Something like that. And then the idea would be how many people would dare to vote for another party which was equally tame. Golkar was the government party. And if there was a slight uptick in the votes for another party, that was seen as an act of civil disobedience, just about. Um, 
So party behavior before and after. So in order to see that cleavage there at the end of the last century, it's departure of Zimbardo, <laughs> turbulent period of time, presidents coming and going as something that's directly related to what I'm going to try to talk to you about today. Because unless you see it in situ, you know, in context, you're going to miss the story. It'll just be another narrative about Islam and a particularly virulent variety of it appealing to youngsters. It's more than that. So you have now 10 parties holding 560 seats. Probably four of those 10 are going to disappear in the next election, which is this coming April. There was a new law in 2017 which said you've got to achieve, I think, 4%. Is that right? You know, you guys are the pros. I'm running into too many terrifyingly competent Indonesia experts here, so shoot me down. But I think it's 4%, isn't it? You've got, in other words, you've got to achieve at least 4% of nationally cast <coughs> votes to get in. It's a bit like party list politics in Germany and New Zealand. Um, and some of them are ostensibly Islamic parties that are probably not going to reach the, the threshold. Um, trying to think of it, the, the one party that I'm thinking of is, what's it? The, yeah, the PKB. No, the PKB is, this is when I, you know, the sense of getting lost in acronyms tends to happen, but there was a group of Sharia-based parties, including especially the PKS, um, it's known as Justice and Prosperity, which is another thing you've got to remember about Indonesia. No one says the Sharia party now and forever, and that's its banner in the election posters. It's, you know, anodyne names like Justice and Prosperity, Peace and Goodwill, Mother and Apple Pie, that kind of thing, uh, which contains an Islamist element, but never triumphant, never transcendent. Um, there's 108, 91 million voters. Their choice, even of the ostensibly open Islamic parties, doesn't indicate a wave toward a stricter interpretation of Islam. In fact, the parties are very much the creatures of locality, and of the people who lead them and of familial dynasties. You go into West Java, for example, and the number of, you know, Banten people, the old families that come from there, it's remarkable. And then, of course, the Darul Islam elements, which was an Islamically inspired rebellion against the new government of Indonesia in the 1950s. But all of that has a tenacious hold. We are inclined as news consumers, I guess just as people, to want the quick, fast, narrative. And yet with Indonesia, the moment you drill into these things, you find locality, you find tri tribe is the wrong word, but ethnicity, uh, habits uh, that go way back, go way back to the origin of the two major um, mass Muslim movements, the Muhammadiyah and the Nadatul Ulama, which were both colonial times. I'm trying to remember which one was the 19th century. Might have been Nadatul Ulama, but in any event, yeah. yeah. It goes way, way back. And it's part of the fabric of Java. It's also important to remember that these mass Muslim movements, by the way, the membership of which, Renatatul Lama, the daughter of Abdurrahman Wahid Gostur, said it's probably 70 million. You know, and I don't think that's sloppy bookkeeping. I think they probably don't know. You know who regards him or herself as a member of Renatatul Lama, in a sense, is irrelevant because it's so big. The other thing to remember is their social organizations, their welfare, their education. They look after widows and orphans. It's not about getting together and firing up, you know, an Islamic teachings. It's very, very different. Although the Muhammadiyah, by the way, supervises the world's, not just Indonesia's, the world's largest number of religious schools. It runs mostly for profit 172 universities in Indonesia, right? which allows it to fund its, I think, benign and important, you know, uh, important activities, which, you know, we and the successive administrations have talked a lot about doing. You know, the idea of having volunteer activities locally situated, community-based things. That's what Nadatul Ulama Muhammadiyah do. Um, the other thing, too, is to, you'll sometimes see articles talking about the vice presidential candidate of the current president who's running for re-election, Widodo. And the guy's name is uh, Ma'aruf uh, Amin, right? Yeah, who's seen as, you know, the Western papers will say conservative. 
But you know, what, what precisely does it mean? Being conservative within a group like Nanatu Lama means being tolerant, right? You have your views, but just because you have your views and just because you're vice president doesn't mean you're going to impose them by fiat. I think an awful lot of bad habits have arisen since 9-11 and the idea of a kind of assertive, uh, intolerant Islam is one of them and we run into it all the time, even without realizing it. I think the other thing to point out, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, is Islam in contemporary Indonesian history has a storied past. And when I say contemporary, I'm using it in the British way. that I learned at Oxford, which is anything that's 100 years ago is still contemporary. And that's a good way to think about the impact of Islam in Indonesia. I mentioned a moment ago the Darul Islam revolt in Western Java, which again, Islam was the centerpiece of it, at least the articulated centerpiece. All of the revolts in Indonesia among the people who happen to embrace Islam are cast in terms of justice. Right? Adil, as they say in Malay. It's really an important point to realize that it's not that they're anxious to cram the Quran or the Hadith down your throat. It's just that their ideas of a just society are derived from that tradition. It's important to realize that because someone will quote something from the Hadith or refer to the Prophet and somehow it seems to be as it were, tainted by Islam. It's not, it's just a tradition. It's important to realize that. But Pemesta, which was a revolt in 1950s in, in Sumatra, and even in the 19th century, Diponogoro, you've probably heard the name. He was, he was a rebel who, again, you know, flew the green flag as he rode across the rice fields on his white charger. I mean, what could be more evocative of, you know, the advance of Islam? And yet it was primarily a local revolt. They were speaking in terms that made sense to them. And remember, they're a syncretic country, syncretic island for sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most interesting things about Indonesia is to run into a set of habits. And they were more pronounced under Suharto, who kept various religious faiths in line. You know, you're aware of the Panchasila, aren't you? The Panchasila means the five principles. It's Sanskrit. And the idea is, and we always forget them. It's humanitarianism, social justice, belief in one God, material welfare, and I'm running out of steam. I can't think of the other, but it's, you know, they're noble, abstract things. But the room that was made available for religious uh, adherence in Indonesia those days, and still today, was Islam, obviously, 70 something, 75% of the population. Roman Catholic Christian, Protestant Christian, Hinduism, and Buddhism. <coughs> And during the time I was there initially, the first time, Sahardo was encouraging the growth of a fifth element to this idea of belief. And it was called Kabatinan, B-A-T-I-N. Batin, you say Mahon Ma'af Lahir, outside Dan Batina, inside. <coughs> and it was the idea that the spirituality needn't to be pegged to belief in a particular God or divinity, that we were, you know, that the world was spiritual and all that kind of thing. And Sahardo really liked that stuff. And there was leeway. Now that was seen as by people who embrace Islam as, if not idolatrous, then straying widely from the path. The other thing I think it's worth working out about Indonesia, so we've gone through the, the points so far that make it unique, the Java, non-Java uh, balance, the slow proselytization from Aceh, West Sumatra, all the way to Java, taking 800 years, liberalization politically after Sahardo, tumultuously, but effectively true and decentralization. So power not just was went to the national capital and more people were grabbing it, it went to the localities as a way to preserve the country. And then the two big large mass Muslim movements which are like those in Egypt and elsewhere, very focused on the broad spectrum of people's needs and beliefs and requirements, social welfare, that type of thing. There's another element that makes it special. I've talked about Islam and contemporary Indonesian history having a recurrent impact in playing to the imagination and remember down the generations, right? It's not some hot-headed embrace of certain precepts, it's not. But another feature that's important to realize is that Indonesia is a place that's experienced a lot of change with globalization, with the ability of people to move, with the arrival of mass literacy, and with tr migration both internally, that is inside the archipelago, and outside the archipelago. 
Inside the archipelago, there were government programs of transmigration. The whole idea was to move people from overpopulated Java to some of the outer islands. That would create interesting difficulties in places and sort of lost its steam. But there's another type of mig and the, the migration, which was called informal migration, and the group that were pr very proud of their Islamic traditions so would come closer to you know, true, uh, fervent, pure Islam than, say, the Javanese tradition. And that would be people from Madura and from South Sulawesi, the Buganese and Madaris. And they would spontaneously move, because the Buganese are traders as well to other islands, have a rather strict interpretation. But again, Islam in the Bugis society is part of the culture. It's not, you know, the, it's, it's part and parcel of what they live and believe. So this question of mass movement of people, I've talked about internal to Indonesia, but outside, of course, I mean, when I first went there, it was, you know, I was sort of, God, so long ago, 20 something. Um, the, um, it was rare to meet an Indonesian who spoke English. Right? It was rare to meet them abroad traveling. All oh, that's changed. You know, there's a significant Indonesian community in the greater Washington, D.C. area, not as big as some of the others, but it's there. And there's a sense of becoming familiar with the world, one. Two, uh, standards of education have arisen enormously since then. The economy is diversified, enabling more people to experience more life choices than ever before. Um, and then the global world, also, of course, invites people to take a direct interest in the events preceding and prior after 9-11. And there's a copycat function. If someone can blow up a place somewhere else, we can blow up a nightclub in Bali, which was frequented by Westerners, primarily Australians in 2002, killed a lot of people, or hotels in Jakarta. So there was a sense of getting getting with the agenda if you took that view that the jihad was a violent uh, displacement of non-believers. So currently, what have we got? We've got a situation in which the things that I've attempted to describe to you hold fast, but also are seeing necessarily and inevitably, we being humans and this being the time going by, Inevitably, things are changing somewhat, and those things that have changed seem to be at variance with the type of Indonesia that people, my generation, and many of the people here remember as being an extraordinarily tolerant place. I'll give you an example. I don't know how many Westerners I've met who might have been oil field workers, you know, in the heyday and are like now in their 70s or something, and they're saying, oh, all the women have hijabs. You know, they're all wearing headdress. There must be a terrible radical elements sweeping through the country. You think, no, not really. It's just, it's kind of a fashion statement. It's religious, yeah, I get it. But it's the idea that you take one accoutrement and blow it up, extrapolate, you know, a type of uh, extremely um, uh, jihadi-minded Islam is way, way wrong. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless, there is, uh, situation at the moment where a number of fringe groups seem to be able to operate with comparative impunity when others not being sussed out. Again, the information revolution has enabled a lot of this to happen. Before, the local policeman or the village ulama would see people wandering around at night and meeting in strange places would be aware, pass the information to the authorities. Now, you've got these damn computers and everyone can be fired up by this stuff, and they've really taken to it. I think there's no place in Southeast Asia where the computer revolution, and certainly the communications part of it, has been adapted with such gusto as, as, as Indonesia. And so with these um, attacks, and just this last year, there was a terrible thing where a family in Surabaya sent their children in to be suicide bombers, and there was three successive explosions, one leveling a police headquarters and killing 12 policemen, but there are other people who were, they just randomly went outside places and blew them up. There's also a disagreeable increase in intolerance of people like the Ahmedis, which are often from Pakistan and are seen as apostates. And Pakistan, to its discredit, has a law saying anyone who embraces Ahmadi version of Islam is an apostate. It's automatic apostasy. Just like Malaysia has a rule, it's a law. 
you cannot change your religion if you're a Malay. It's impossible. You can't do it. What do you mean? You must be mad. We'll take you to the asylum. So there's this business of saying, you know, fixed, fixed viewpoints are sort of taking hold, and, and you'll find a degree, in my personal opinion, of executive cowardice in the Indonesian government when it comes to thinking about protecting the Ahmadis. And also there are, not many, but there are Sharia, not Sharia, what am I saying? Um, no, 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 Sunnis and Shia. Shia. There are Shia Muslims in Jakarta and other parts of Java, not many, but they're feeling under threat as well. Again, is it the contemporary world? Is it really a rising movement within Indonesia? The thing that Elon Berman, the senior vice president of the think tank where I work, and I wrote about was probably not, that the endurance of these traditions is very strong, um, that the tolerant, thing, it isn't just, oh, let's be tolerant today and everyone will like us. It's, it's imbued in the Javanese outlook. And I find the only time someone refused to shake my hand the whole time I was in Indonesia, various times since then, it was in the middle of Kalimantan, north of Palankaraya. And there was a person there who was an alama, and I introduced myself to hand, shake the hand, and he went like this. And guess where he was from? Pakistan. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Oh. So it was the Wahhabi thing way back in the early 80s. Way back, right? So none of this is, is new. None of this is easily extirpated. But let me give you a bit of a kind of a, a summary and let, you, let me have a bit of this and let you ask some questions if you like and throw it out to you because I'm very interested in your views as people who are by and large interested in Indonesia, sometimes intimately, and follow events there because you know I go back only periodically. I am not a religious scholar, uh, far from it. Um, I think the first thing to think of is, is what I've just said. It is a tolerant country, tolerant. And you know, people, you'll see people dressed, even sometimes the full hijab. But you know, I went to, there's a theater in Java, in Jakarta called Miss Chichi. Have you ever heard of this? It's a popular street theater. It's done in Sundanese and Bahasa Batawi. Bahasa Batawi means Jakarta language. And people dress up. Sometimes a sorcerer, sometimes they dress up as Hindu, Java, you know, um, medicine men, and then sometimes grasping landlords, and then sometimes ulamas, but it's all part of the flow. And it's super important to understand that and not be upset by things that occur because that is newsworthy. You blow something up, that's pretty newsworthy still. Uh, so tolerance, and then second, it is a socially turbulent time, both because of what happened after Sahardo, the democratization, decentralization, liberalization of things, and also because that's the state of the world today. It's enormously turbulent, in case you haven't noticed. Mass movement, the numbers of people in the air at any time are staggering, and people going places and forming good or bad opinions. So it's turbulent times since Sahardo. Third, the global communications revolution and exposure to many things, the ability to speak English is extraordinary. I remember visiting our ambassador, the American ambassador in uh, Cairo, and they were dismayed to hear that I described that I'd gone down the medieval mile, you know, the place where all the Uba uh, Umayyad and Abbasid uh, mosques are there, some of them in a sad state. And I said, yeah, I wanted to go to the Al-Azhar, the, the university. I said, yeah, because, you know, they don't really speak Arabic. They're, so many are from Southeast Asia. They speak Indonesian or Tagalog, you know. And the staff, the ambassador was cool, but the staff said, you did what? You know, they had never been. We have closed ourselves off an awful lot with the strictures of the security people. So, there are continuities that I've mentioned to you, most particularly the mass nature of the two major uh, Islamic groups, mass Muslim organizations, Muhammadiyah and Nadatul Ulama. They continue to be very influential. Within the PKB, which is a party, they're almost synonymous. If you're working with that party, that party will be Nadatul Ulama. It's a very fractured and fragmented electoral and political picture, and so it should be. Indonesia is not the sort of place which is going to give you a one-size-fits-all political suasion. Final thought, and a troubling one for me, is when we were there, we met with some of the people in the Nadatul Ulama, daughter of Abdurrahman Wahid, 
name. Yenny. Yenny, Yenny, of course. And we were introduced to a group of theirs, which is like the youth wing. And they, are, they form kind of protective activities. They're, they're meant to kind of involve the youth in healthy, wholesome activities and all the rest. And this is a big thing because it's not a dual There are millions and millions of people who belong to this thing called Ansor. But it also reminded some people, not me, not just me, of the days in this, the late Sukarno period when street fighting between gangs related to you know, political parties and various movements were a common phenomenon. The application of street muscle is something that seems to be happening a little bit more often in Indonesia than before. So with those thoughts, and forgive me, they're a tad bit random, um, but they, I wanted to approach it in a slightly different way and um, be very happy to take any questions that you have. Just please wait till you have a microphone and speak straight into it. Hold, you have to hold it up. And, uh, <coughs> to what degree is tourism? I beg your pardon? To what degree is tourism a percentage of very common? Is it a heavy degree or is it a light degree? And how does the Islamic uh, movement affect tourism? Yeah, good question, and multifaceted. I mean, you know, I, you still go to Japan and find people who are looking for a country called Bali, and they go, why? My visa says Indonesia. Where's the Balinese visa? So, you know, great numbers of people are moving around the world. Vast, you know, who is it? Matthew Arnold talked about ignorant armies, you know. Vast numbers of people not bringing a great deal because they go on package tours and all the rest of it. And there's always a risk, and I certainly see this in the South Pacific and the Caribbean, of countries becoming a nation of waiters. So I would think that in that particular element, the Balinese tourist phenomenon, some of the outer island stuff, has opened people's eyes. But remember, it's not a new phenomenon. Bali's been visited for a long, long, long time, even during the Dutch East Indies time. It was a very fashionable place to go. Um, beyond that, the Indonesians themselves are now tourists. So it's not a question of they're being recipients, but they'll go over to places, you know, they'll have Richtofil in um, Amsterdam, which is the best, you know, sort of um, Javanese type style of rice that you can find in the world. And they'll go there and they feel a type of affinity. It's very weird. They feel a type of affinity with the, the former Dutch colonial oppressor. But th that's what it is. So tourism is a multifaceted thing. Um, and then you have... And it's an interesting thing that you've tangentially raised, too. The Indonesians are now part of the global labor force, right? It used to be Philippine maids or whatever the hell it was, you know, Sri Lankan day laborers and working in Qatar. But now the Indonesians are out there. And there's a huge uproar over the capital punishment given to an Indonesian maid who resisted a rapist who was uh, her employer. And she was in prison nine years. And they just killed her recently. Where? And, hmm? Where? Is Saudi Arabia. And you know, the degree of hatred for people from the Gulf who have contempt for Southeast Asian Islam is very underestimated. You know, and often that's the thing that plays against the people who are, want to be strict or jihadi minded, takfiri, salafi, whatever you want to call it, minded Muslims, <coughs> because it's seen as aping the Arabs. And that doesn't go down well, at least in Java at least most places in Java. Whereas the Malays, Malay, you know, Malay, Malaysia is a, a, an Islamic state by its constitutional arrangement. And they have, it's the Hanafi school, but they, so they're not way over the, the top towards Wahhabi stuff, but they're very keen to be seen as a kind of fully participating member of the Islamic world. And um, of course there's the Philippines. And that's another element to remember. Southeast Asian Islam is not something that just has flown into consciousness as a result of the aftermath of 9-11. Um, you know, we went in to the Philippines and snuffed out an independence movement in 1898 and fought a very brutal war against insurgents, including people in the south in Mindanao. Now, at that time, Mindanao, if you looked at the whole population of the Philippine archipelago, Mindanao probably had 15% of the total population would have been Muslim. It's down to about two now because of huge demographic shifts by the Filipinos and migration coming down from the Visayas into Mindanao. But that's a place where, again, people say, oh, it's an Islamic revolt against the central government. Well, actually, we make it an Islamic revolt by tarring them as Islamic enemies. 
And that's, you know, the 45 pistol was supposedly, this is the, the, the urban legend designed to stop a Moro charging at you full tilt. I mean, that kind of unhappy talk. <coughs> so Islam as a identifying thing, as a source of inspiration for justice, is big in the region. One thing that should also be mentioned too is that with the fluidity of movement in Southeast Asia, and of course people speak Malay, Indonesian, and you know, Brunei, uh, Malaysia, even Southern Thailand. So those currents, which are sometimes not very consistent with the way the Javanese approach Islam, are in, f in full play too. So there's a lot in the mix. Um, I think I've exhausted your patience in it, trying to expand the definition of tourist, but there it is. <laughs> yes, Michael. <clears throat> on your trip, Jim, did you, uh, <clears throat> did you um, get an update at all on what's happening over on Papua, which you didn't mention, and very specifically the effort to, uh, of the Freeport mine to <coughs> finally be turned over to majority Indonesia ownership? I don't know if it's actually happened yet, but it's in the works under Indonesian law. And this, that's is the, this is the Freeport Macaron Freeport operation. Uh, Macaron, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'll just, for those of you who aren't conversant with this, Freeport was the first company to go in after the new order, quote unquote, of General Saharto took power. And the, the story goes, and I've had it confirmed, is that the fellow, Jim Bob, what was his name? He was the head of the Freeport McMoran, the names escaped me. He went out and he did an Elvis impersonation of, for General Suharto, who thought it was so terrific that he invited him to stay. And of course, one thing led to another. And the biggest copper and gold mine in Southeast Asia, I think the biggest copper mine in the world, in the world. number two in the world, it, um, I mean, it was a license to print money for Freeport for a very long time. To give them credit, over year, the years, they began to be perhaps belatedly, perhaps not attentive to things like the local indigenous people and what kind of working conditions and will you please take care of the destruction you're wreaking on the environment. So, you know, they played catch up. Um, and now the question Michael raises is, it's been an underlying nationalist thing. And again, a very important element of understanding Indonesia is that resources are seen as the patrimony of the country, no matter how corruptly they're exploited by Pertamin and others, but that is, fixed. So the idea that some foreign company should just have this right in perpetuity to kind of mine gold and copper and nickel um, increasingly ran up against resistance. I'm taking a long time to say, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I know that it's there and there's a chance that Wadota is going to do it. Just like um, a lot of shipping rules are just going to require foreign shippers to do things. And of course, is that a good thing or not? Um, so, the, and the other thing was... Papua. Papua. Everyone know what I'm talking about when I say Papua? Okay, Papua New Guinea. The western half of this extraordinary island in which two-thirds of the world's languages can be found. The whole world, two-thirds are languages there, and it is an island with deep ravines and mountain ranges that all run east to west. Bismarck, over brandy and a cigar, so the Congress in Berlin said, well, we've had a good day dividing up Africa. And someone says, oh, well, what about that place, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea? Everyone goes, oh, God, it's late. And he says, I'll take care of it. So he went out there, <laughs> went there, <laughs> this is a perfect picture, drew a straight ruler down the, this island, just follow the, the latitude. Longitude. Longitude, of course, I'm just testing you. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite right, the longitude. Duh. Um, and they, everyone's lived with it since. Now, part of it in the way it belonged to the Netherlands and the eastern part had been German, at least the bottom part, the, north, uh, the top part. And that's why you come across, top, that's right, you come across names like New Bismarck and various things. It's uh, completely nuts. Anyway, the point is they're very ethnically different from the predominant Malay peoples of Southeast Asia. And... Um, one of the most unpleasant things I saw when I was there, they had just opened a thing called Taman Mini Indonesia. And it was a really interesting concept. You had kind of landscaping to create islands that were seen from the air. It looked like a map of the archipelago. 
And there were different people there living in, you know, Monongabao houses and various things. It was tourist stuff. Um, and then I, the saddest thing of all was the Irian Jaya, as they used to call it one. And they were kind of, I don't know, just hanging around in their kind of grass dresses and things. And I said, do you like doing this? He said, what do you think? We're in a zoo, mm. right? And there is an unpleasant part of that part of, you know, the greater Malay peoples. It's a slight looking down on peoples like um, the Papuans or the Melanesians generally, they have a hard time. Um, and the answer to that is more trouble coming. How can it not be? Uh, there are people in the West who are trying to fan interest in helping them achieve some kind of at least basic autonomy, but it's usually run by the military, either overtly or disguised. And um, the, the group that originally rose against the Indonesian military, I guess it goes right back to the 70s or 80s, was called the OPM, and um, a ragtag group, really, for sure. So either by force of arms or force of suasion or pressure from outside, I regard it as an unlikely thing. But then we all said that in 1998 about East Timor. So who knows? East Timor is the most extraordinary thing. I went to Portugal when I was a Georgetown professor. Seeing the foreign minister, I said, I said, you'll never get that place free. The Indonesian military got it under their thumb. You know, they're all fight like cats amongst each other. Forget it. And he said, you wait. And we did. And it changed. I was right there with um, President Carter's group, I uh, forget what it's called. Uh, Carter the Center. Carter Center. Center. Yes, I, I, oh, just, just, just checking here. <laughs> Carter Center, and we were up uh, monitoring the vote. And we uh, had the bad luck, to, we and another fellow, bad luck to be last out of the highlands of East Timor, getting to Dili at the time, navigating roadblocks manned by drunken kids with M16s. I mean, really high as kite kids. And each time I'd have to get out and say, you know, my pretty good Indonesian at the time saying, wow, that's a really amazing rifle. Where'd you get that gun? Wow, how'd you do that? You know, uh, you know, like playing the gringo fool for six times getting there. And Michael will remember this. We all got out on an ancient Hawker Siddeley British jet prop plane. And as we looked behind, you could see, and it was very, very disturbing. Once again, the gringos got to get away safety, and the uh, militias were closing in on the compound. It wasn't, wasn't pretty. It's a real indelibly pictured thing. So East Timor was one of those things, yeah, it'd be a good idea if, and we're sorry for you, but accept your fate. Well, they didn't, and now arguably they're becoming a Chinese colony, but that's another matter. <laughs> yes, sir? Um, we were talking before the mm -hmm. those of us who are Russia contemporaries go back the same number of years about Indonesia. And the Indonesia that you described, the layered culture, the tolerance are all there. And we've been seeing it. Uh, Bill Little, for instance, and every yeah. time there's an election, you know, talks about how the Muslim parties never really gain anything. But, and that's the but that's a little yeah. disturbing, say a couple of words about Ahok. Yes. And just how Islam really did inject itself in a yeah. very frightening way. Frightening and rapid way. Ahok is an ethnic Chinese Indonesian who became mayor, I think, by, by initially kind of governor. 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 Yeah, it was governor of the Jakarta province, right? Mm -hmm. And he was displaced uh, and vilified uh, by street demonstrations, which acquired a rolling character. The Hizb al Tahir, right, is the group, and they mobilize people. And it's not clear, he was accused of having blasphemed against the word of the Prophet. And he's an extraordinarily cultured and interesting guy, with a great sense of humor, by the way. But that was taken amiss by the rather strict puritanical types who were opposing him. And I didn't think that it stood at much of a chance to go anywhere, but it did. But he's in jail. He's in jail. So blasphemy is one of those things that's now out there as something can be leveled against you, right? Uh, unfairly. Unfairly. Well, try Pakistan. Try a lot of places where blasphemy is, you know, what do they say in Indonesian? It's like treachery. Uh, so there's all of that. 
And that's a, a disturbing feature. I still think it's a bigger picture than just that, and I think it can be contained. But with Dodo, on the other hand, the parliament passed new laws against uh, homegrown terrorism. On the other hand, they've been releasing people, so it's a kind of carrot stick, carrot thing, where they try to do the same thing. Actually, in a way, the Saudis did. I once flew over there to see Prince Mohammed bin Nayef's rehabilitation efforts for people who he'd sprung from Guantanamo Bay. And you had the sense of kind of great pretense about it, that actually their minds were made up and they were released into the wider world and you could expect some trouble, not from everybody, but you could. Just one comment, if I can make. Absolutely. You're talking about jilbabs as a fashion statement. Uh, a woman who worked for me in the embassy uh, had never worn a jilbab, and she came in one day with one. And I knew her well enough to say, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, my laws are giving me a little bit of pressure, but I'll tell you what, it saves me 15 minutes in the morning because you can't have a bad hair day with a joke on. Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, I was trying on a few myself, no. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very good point, and it actually leads us to that point I've been attempting, perhaps imperfectly, to, to emphasize, which is it's complicated, right? And... You're not, you know, don't be put off by the fact that people look intimidating because of their dress. They're Indonesians. They're li likely to be Javanese Indonesians or Sunda people in Jakarta. I remember once in um, Rawalpindi, was, we, we were all dressed up like monkeys like this, and I was with a group of people from the American government, and everyone was spooked by the fact that on the other side, about where the camera was, on the other side of the street, a number of ulama and people with the, you know, the turban and all the rest of their gap teeth people. And I said, well, just go say hi. So you go up, assalamu alaikum, and all of that, and faces open up. We're curious, you know, they don't get us. They work in stereotypes just as we do, perhaps even more so, more virulently so. But it doesn't mean that we can't make the effort. Yes, sir. So, you. Here's the mic. Mike. 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 With regard to shaking hands, uh, you mentioned one incident where a Saudi, somebody with a Saudi background, Can you the mic, shake please? He wants you to hold somebody, the mic quite close. <laughs> somebody with a Saudi background refused to shake your hand. Yeah. What, what about meeting women? Have you encountered women refusing to shake your Never. hand? Never. <laughs> Never. But on the other hand, I don't lunge forward. I'm not running for president. You know, hey, how are you? You know. But I, I say, madam, how are you? And then there, it's also kind of a, it's a touchy country too. I mean, touchy feeling. Hi, do you, you, you gonna nail me? I'm not allowed to speak, it's right the mic. Really? And speak closely. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so thanks for the optimistic report that uh, the things we worry about here have, have developed, but not as much as people get the impression. Uh, I have a question about inevitability or otherwise. Um, there was, as you emphasized, a secular dictatorship, Suharto, very similar to other secu secular national post-colonial governments, yeah. although Sukarno came first. Uh, and there's been a trend toward indigenization and re-religionization, not only in the Islamic world, but even in India. Uh, so the Congress party gets displaced partly by the Hindu nationalists. Mm -hmm. Do you see this as inevitable as indigenously developing in Indonesia as well? Or do you see it more as a product of the external <coughs> influence of this development throughout the rest of the Islamic world uh, and the copycat element? And a second question related, wouldn't it be conceivable for the Suharto regime, type regime, not Suharto himself, but a secular authoritarian regime uh, to have continued in place of democratic or de uh, political liberalization and democratization, could have there been continued social liberalization and modernization? Sort of like the China. Such a regime. Like, yeah. And if so, would these disturbing trends, even if not as bad as people think they are, still they're there, would these same disturbing trends have inevitably developed anyway in terms of Islamic intolerance, Islamism, yeah. and some terrorism, or would such a regime have more successfully prevented it? I think that's of some ideological importance here because America made the theory that 
democratization is the answer to Islamism, and the opposite possibility is democratization is what has promoted Islamism. Well, I always like to comment that the former foreign minister of a country called Yugoslavia made to Jim Baker when he said, how do you feel about these elections, really? He said, I'm not actually sure the country's going to be there much longer. It's, he saw elections as a partisan mobilizing thing that would reinforce ethnic hatreds and re resurrect an awful lot of difficulties. So the idea of contestation periodically through elections plays to the type of possible result you're just mentioning. I think that I don't want to seem a Pollyanna about all this. I think things anywhere can go bad and can go quickly wrong. I think that, for example, there's an awful lot in the super saturated solution that is Java today. I mean, it's cheek to Java life. And luckily, there's been an improvement in economic circumstances. But what if three volcanoes go off at the same time? I mean, the, the devastation that will visit on the farming sector and all the rest is huge. Um, so I think that, you know, that there is an awful lot of talk about this at the moment. Is the Chinese model something you'd want to emulate? Well, if you're some dictator in Africa, sure you want to emulate. Everybody's making money, no one's giving you trouble, at least it looks that way. So the idea is, can you have prosperity? You know, Gorbachev went the political liberalization route. The Chinese always tell you this. That was their big mistake. We didn't. We kept tight control. And, and for a look into that, read Richard McGregor's book, The Party. It's just absolutely fantastic how it describes a Leninist outfit, top down, being capitalist, making money. So I think your answer is, is your question's a good one. I think that you, I think the relations, the daughter of Suharto is even talking about resurrecting the good old days. You know, there's already getting to be a sense of missing the old man, even with his interminable speeches. Uh, <laughs> and. That's always out there. People go in the direction of authoritarians. If you have something to lose, property holding middle, lower middle class person, and it's threatened, do you go for free speech and you know, free association, or do you go for authority? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. You're protective that way. So the answer, I think, is I'm kind of surprised that Indonesia's managed as well as it has. I think it's extraordinary what they were able to do with the downfall of Suharto. Let's forget there, not forget there were huge riots in Jakarta, attacks on the ethnic Chinese minority there and in Maidan. Things looked very, very bad, and they pulled themselves together. And I, my argument, I'll tell you one thing, I would occasionally do some consulting for Exxon, and it was weird, you know, I'd write some long paper, this and that, and argumentation, ad Syria, and they say, Jim, just call in, we'll patch you in. And we were talking about, <laughs> so okay, there I am. And it's good. we got a, three or four Bs we got to invest, billions, you know. That seemed big money back then, when Saharda was falling. And I said, yeah. He said, should we put it into Saudi or Indonesia? I said, I think Indonesia. Well, but it's falling apart. I said, nope, it's not. It's, it's elastic. It can take it. It can take an awful lot of stretching and, mm -hmm. and bending and buckling. And I will not tell you what I was paid for that <laughs> minute and a half comment, but I, I, visions of sugar plums danced in my head. And I thought, this is great. I love consulting. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. Yes, who's next? Do you hear anything of the emerging groups of cults in the younger generation? I think that's a, you've touched on a really good point. And again, it's part of the culture, too. There's an awful lot of... I think the word in Indonesian is aliran. It sort of means like currents or you know, temperaments. And they've you know, always had a kind of mystical bent. And sometimes that they'll take that mysticism and it will be look like Sufi Islam, which is mystical too. Other times it'll be Javanese to a fault to the people who are looking for strict purity and aesthetic uh, reward. And so the answer is yes, there are. They're probably not dangerous. They're things that young people do anyway. Um, but the cult part is seen also in, who's the fellow Abdurrahman who's just been executed? He was a leader who really led his group of young followers into blowing up stuff in Jakarta mm -hmm. and paid the death, uh, paid the price, was executed. So I think people watch over this very, very tightly. 
And one thing that hasn't changed from Indonesia, even though it's in the hands of a democracy now, democratic arrangement, very, very free and open. You just look at Indonesian media, it's incredible. But one thing that hasn't changed is the role of the intelligence agencies. They're there, and um, if they're maintaining peace and order within a democratic environment and not being excessively harsh, I'm, I'm for it. Good question. Jim, if I could bring up to uh, current times and policy issues. Are you worried or concerned at all that Indone Indonesia might get, and ASEAN, say, might get lost in the shuffle as the Trump administration shifts from an Asia-Pacific focus to an Indo-Pacific focus? With Indonesia in the middle and ASEAN presumably less less important and the pivot to Asia kind of forgotten. Yeah, I hope, does all that make sense to you guys? Do you, in Pacific, Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific? Some of it's word games, some of it's stuff designed to kind of pull the Indians in to our nefarious schemes to kind of blunt Chinese assertiveness. That's what it's about, it's balance of power stuff. And the Indians, of course, are extraordinarily attentive to their own pride and sovereignty and all the rest of it. So the idea of overtly lining up with us is anathema. So what are the things that you, India, want in the Indian Ocean? And we'll just pull them into our worldview. At the moment, the Indians are saying the Indo-Pacific, at least as they see it, reaches all the way to Madagascar and Kenya. And then as others see it, you know, they see it reaching across the Asia Pacific, all the way to Chile and South America. So it's a big area. A lot of people are earning good think tank salaries thinking out what the Indo-Pacific means. If you go in and do a search, it's mostly mid-career academics who are coming out with an awful lot of stuff that looks important but doesn't really address, doesn't really address the issue. They're, they're trying to give substance to something which is a fictive diplomatic device, in my view. But it's good. I mean, one time when I was in the Pentagon, we had, um, does anyone know what the quad is? The quad, we're not talking about a university, the quad, the quadrilaterals, India, Australia, Japan, and the US. And the idea that we'd even think of meeting would freak the Chinese out. And we put together a meeting and someone it was at the side of a meeting of an ASEAN, so it was the quad, they were all there for some reason. So we had a separate room in the hotel and everybody, talked and they said, but what's the agenda? And I said, in the cable back, I said, it doesn't matter the agenda. Talk about the Chelsea Garden Show. I remember saying that, you know, yeah. anything you like. I said, the fact that it happens. So anyway, fast forward, Mike Pizzullo is Deputy Secretary of Defense for Australia, came into the office in the Pentagon. He said, boy, we were really given a hard time by the Chinese. I said, you were? He said, yeah. He says, they demolished us last week. Twice, three times. So one of the younger staff in, in, in OSD said, tut, 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 really? Well, that's it. He said, no, mate. He says, that's the whole idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do. You, you, know, you, you measure short of war and then some. You play this minuet. And they still can't bear the idea that there's a common interest, which is explicitly or in, and implicitly anti-People's Republic of China agenda. And that's, that's where we're going. So the Indo-Pacific question is a really good one, but it's all about what wallpaper are we gonna put up in our new creation? And the final point, Michael, is ASEAN has been amazingly successful at being the clearinghouse through which issues don't really need to go, right? It's much easier to talk about the Senkakus in Northeast Asia without all the Southeast Asians hanging around and without the Khmers and the Laos passing every bit of information directly to the Chinese. You've heard that, haven't you? That if you want China to really know something fast and reliably, tell the Cambodians. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of where it is. Well, it's all right. That's the world as it is. So I think that um, there's a lot that can be done with that kind of wallpaper, but don't fall into the trap of thinking that whatever the, the latest communique about the Indo-Pacific is saying really reflects any reality. I mean, it's like State Department coming up with a new program. And what you look behind the, the podium and they're, all they're doing is taking programs together and shuffling the cards in a new way. And they don't have any money. 
and it's dressed up as something, and then it always looks mean spirited and you know second best when you measure against the Chinese. If I may, uh, James, the, um, you, someone mentioned the media in Indonesia. I know that the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which inherited the Voice of America from USIA and the other government broadcasting entities, has spent a lot of money uh, in Indonesia on television and radio. Are you aware of any impact or any awareness of, of that presence? No, I asked about it obliquely and indirectly, but the, the, not the direct answer I got, but the impression I got was it's a riot of contending voices and channels and cable this and do that, satellite this and that. So the idea that you're gonna have some diktat that will work, and you've written so convincingly about the, our reaction after 9-11, you know, you can't, fool them. There are people who pass that message implicitly, but I'm not aware of it, and certainly nobody spoke to it, and we gave them plenty of opportunity when I was out there with Dr. Berman. So if I can just ask one last question. Sure, whatever you say. Uh, of course, Afghanistan had a form of folk Islam very much like the one we're describing. Yeah, good point. In Indonesia, that's been largely, if not completely, destroyed by the Taliban. Uh, well, actually shaking his head. Well, it's, it's, it's been damaged by the Taliban. The shrines have been blown up, and et cetera. Um, and we know that some of the roots of that go back to what the Saudis did in the Afghan refugee camps uh, in Pakistan yeah, during right. the war with the Soviet Union. No one spoke more forthrightly or angrily against Saudi influence in Indonesia than Abdul Rahman Wahid. Yes, he also went to Israel. Um, you, you have, I won't say you've been dismissive about it, but I, I've heard from others who go regularly to Indonesia who are, are worried about the damage to folk Islam the Wahhabi influence has done. I'm not remotely dismissive. I tend to try to see it in a larger picture, which is an awful lot of that stuff just by the f rapid movement of contemporary society and change and globalization is at risk anyway. Look to the people who run the World Monuments Fund up in New York. I mean, every week there's some hideous tale, not of a war, you know, blowing it up like they did those statues in, in what was it, Bamyan, but, um, the, but just cleared for a new hotel or something. I mean, it's inexorable. So I, that's partly what I'm saying. And in Java, the lure of modernity and money and prosperity and flashy things that work is true. It's just true. On the other hand, I think there is something in the, the zeitgeist, you know, the, the contemporary mood in Indonesia that's slightly more intolerant, maybe may, a lot more intolerant of those little interesting swirls and eddies in the flow of religiosity in Indonesia that made it such an interesting place. I hung out with some people who were working with this. Remember I mentioned there was a sixth possible stream that Suharto was interested in, Kabatina and mysticism. You know, I just, went along for about a month talking to these people and found it fascinating. Rather vague, <laughs> but uh, interesting stuff. And that was, I don't think it's easy to do now. I think that there's a lot self-imposed strictures. But remember, all times change. There, this is it's kind of an embarrassment. And someone getting up there saying, death to the infidel and all the rest of it just doesn't cut it. Not that kind of country. Great. Jim, thank you very much.